Hello everyone, welcome back to Let's Learn Physics, the show where I explain graduate level physics textbooks to curious minds like you. Last time in Classical Dynamics, we looked at special relativity, and today we're going into chapter 8, Hamiltonian Mechanics. Before we jump in, let's remind ourselves what physics is all about. Physics is the science of motion and change. Any physical system can be described with coordinates. They could be positions in space, they could be angles, they could be velocities, they could be vibrational modes, anything that can be used to describe the state of a system at any given moment in time. And what we're looking for in any given system is equations of motion that describe how those coordinates change over time and let us predict the states and paths the system will take into the future. We've already looked at two methods for determining equations of motion in this series. First off was Newtonian mechanics, which involves identifying the forces on an object and then putting it into Newton's second law. The sum of the forces on an object is equal to its mass times its acceleration. Newtonian mechanics describes the science of motion in terms of forces and acceleration, and it takes place in physical space. Next, we learned the Lagrangian method for equations of motion. The Lagrangian method uses generalized coordinates. It could be positions in space, but it could also be other things. And it describes the state of a system in configuration space with generalized coordinates. The Lagrangian method lets us understand systems in terms of energy and action. Now we're going into the third method, Hamiltonian mechanics, which describes states in terms of coordinates and momentum. A Hamiltonian understanding of a physical system takes place in phase space. Phase space is hard to diagram because for every coordinate there are two dimensions on the diagram, the coordinate and its conjugate momentum. So we can really only draw one at a time. The coordinate goes on the horizontal axis and the momentum goes on the vertical axis. The changing of the coordinates and momentum makes a vector that is the velocity in phase space. And in fact, this entire space is a vector field. Now it might seem complicated, but remember, momentum is tied to the changing coordinate. So the higher vertically, the stronger to the right the vector points, and the lower vertically, the stronger to the left. Hamilton's equations of motion tell us whether a coordinate is more likely to change faster or slower. The system traces a path through the phase space in the direction of these velocity vectors. And it should be noted that right along the coordinate axis, there is zero horizontal component to those vectors. So every path through phase space always crosses the coordinate axis vertically. With properly formulated Hamiltonian mechanics, if we know the initial position and momentum of every coordinate, we can predict its motion for the entirety of the future, depending, of course, on the precision of our values. Like Lagrangian mechanics, this does not require it to be position in space and momentum as mass times velocity. They are generalized coordinates and they're conjugate momenta. It's worth noting that all three methods, Newtonian, Lagrangian, and Hamiltonian mechanics, will ultimately give equations that describe the same physical system and make the same predictions. The difference is that these three methods each have situations where they're more practical. Hamiltonian mechanics is useful, for instance, for field theory and quantum physics and statistical mechanics. And I am astonished that I made it through grad school without knowing it. So with that in mind, let's go into section 8.1, Legendre transformations and the Hamilton equations of motion. We've learned about the Lagrangian, which is a function of coordinates, velocities, and time. And we can use something called a Legendre transformation, which the book goes into, but I'll spare you the details right now, to convert the Lagrangian into a function of positions, momenta, and time. And this new function is called the Hamiltonian. Now it's significant to note that the positions and momenta are independent and orthogonal. That means they can function as separate coordinates, which is why phase space and the Hamiltonian method works. Once we've used this conversion, we may still have velocities in the equation, so we can convert them to momenta using this equation. And there's a neat feature about this function, the Hamiltonian. When it doesn't depend on time and the potential is conservative, 
The Hamiltonian is just the total energy. The book then states these as the canonical equations of Hamiltonian, or the Hamiltonian equations of motion. It waits to justify them until later, so we will do that as well. Notice that while the Lagrangian equations were second order differential equations, the Hamiltonian equations are first order differential equations, and they have a nice symmetry to them. In fact, they can all be written together in matrix notation or symplectic notation like this, where that J is a particular matrix that picks out coordinates and momenta. If we started from the Lagrangian, the velocity equations are just the transformation equations of momentum. They don't give us any new information. But if we start purely from the Hamiltonian, they do give us information. Let's look at an example of a particle in a conservative potential field. You could think of this potential field as the Earth's gravitational field if you'd like a specific example. The velocity equation tells us the velocity is equal to the derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to momentum. The Hamiltonian is equal to kinetic energy plus potential energy, and the potential energy does not depend on the momentum. So the velocity is the derivative of the kinetic energy with respect to momentum, which if we do the math, it is. The momentum change equation tells us that the change in momentum is equal to the derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to position. The kinetic energy does not depend explicitly on position, and so the change in momentum is equal to the derivative of the potential with respect to position. But we know from Newtonian mechanics that the derivative of the potential is equal to the force, and Newton's second law tells us that the force is equal to the change in momentum over time. Let's look at this in phase space, where the potential comes from the gravitational field. Or actually, let's switch these axes so that the up and down coordinate points up and down. The solution to the Hamiltonian equations give us the vectors in this space. And if we trace paths along the vectors, we can see that they follow parabolic arcs. Remember, the vertical height of the line is the position of the object, and the horizontal position of the line is how fast it's moving. This trajectory shows us that an object moves slower the higher it gets under the influence of gravity. And the greater its starting momentum, the higher its maximum height. So that's an example of how using the Hamiltonian method can give us the answers that we already know from a system we're familiar with. Section 8.2, Cyclic Coordinates and Conservation Theorems. Like with the Lagrangian, if a coordinate does not appear explicitly in the Hamiltonian, its conjugate momentum is conserved. Think of a half pipe at a skate park. If a skateboard goes up and down the pipe, that momentum is not conserved, but its momentum down the long ways is conserved. If the coordinates do not depend on time and the potential does not depend on the velocities, the Hamiltonian is equal to the energy of the system. Now the thing about the Hamiltonian, which is different from the Lagrangian, is that the Hamiltonian will be different depending on the coordinates we choose for a system. An example is two masses oscillating on a spring without the influence of gravity. If our coordinate is the position of the first mass with respect to the laboratory, the Hamiltonian is the energy of the system and it's conserved. But if our coordinate is the position of the first mass relative to the second mass, the Hamiltonian is still the energy, but it is not conserved. That is because in coordinates where we treat the second mass as if it's fixed, there is a fictional force that keeps it steady. Section 8.3 is Routh's procedure, or Ruth's procedure. I couldn't find the official pronunciation. It turns out that the Lagrangian is more convenient for explicit coordinates, and the Hamiltonian is more convenient for cyclic coordinates. So there's a new function called the Routhian, which is the cyclic Hamiltonian minus the explicit Lagrangian. When we do this, there's no overlap between what's left of the Hamiltonian and what's left of the Lagrangian. So we can put the entire Routhian through Lagrange's equations and Hamilton's equations, and each of those equations produces zero, except when it's most convenient. The Lagrangian equations hit all of the explicit coordinates, whereas the Hamiltonian equations hit all of the cyclic coordinates. Section 8.4 is the Hamiltonian formulation of relativistic mechanics. So last video, I skipped one of the sections on the relativistic Lagrangian because I didn't understand it very well. Now I think it's time to redeem myself. The Hamiltonian can be found relativistically by the same two methods as the Lagrangian. 
The first method is to choose a reference frame and use a three-dimensional Lagrangian or Hamiltonian. The problem is with both Lagrangian and Hamiltonian is that it does not work categorically to say the Lagrangian is the kinetic energy minus the potential energy. And since the Hamiltonian relies on knowing the Lagrangian, finding the Hamiltonian is just as hard. So often we'll have to start with the equations of motion, which we find out experimentally, and work backward to find a suitable Lagrangian or Hamiltonian. The second method is to use the same conversion equation, but with a covariant Lagrangian to find a covariant Hamiltonian. That is a Hamiltonian that is a function of the coordinates, the momenta, time, and a time component of momentum. We can get around this problem with the Hamiltonian if it satisfies the conditions for being the total energy, in which case we can write it as the total energy. By putting time into the conversion for finding its conjugate momentum, we discover that the time conjugate momentum is equal to minus the three-dimensional Hamiltonian, which if that is the energy, it means the time conjugate momentum is minus the energy. And if the coordinate is multiplied by a constant, the conjugate momentum is divided by that constant, which gives us the familiar energy divided by the speed of light. Section 8.5, derivation of Hamilton's equations from a variational principle. So you remember back in chapter two when we talked about how Lagrange's equations of motion come from something called the principle of least action? Well, it turns out I wasn't quite right about that because uh, the next section is called the principle of least action and Apparently, we haven't talked about it yet. But we can find the Hamilton equations of motion by substituting the conversion between Lagrangian and Hamiltonian into the same process that led us to find the Lagrangian equations of motion. This gives us a function of the coordinates, the velocities, the momenta, the change in momenta, and time. Now that's a lot of variables, but we can do the same calculus of variations that we did with the Lagrangian on all of these variables, and with a few tricks of algebra, we end up with the Hamilton equations of motion. Section 8.6, finally, the principle of least action. So far in our variational calculus, we've held the endpoints of our paths constant. Now we allow the endpoints to vary. And the variation in the action is given by this equation. There's the varied Lagrangian integrated between the varied endpoints minus the unvaried Lagrangian between the unvaried endpoints. This may look complicated, but it's really the same thing as the deltas we learn in college freshman physics. The change is equal to the final minus the initial. After a lot of advanced math that I didn't fully understand, it comes to the conclusion that the variation of the kinetic energy is equal to zero. This means in Hamiltonian mechanics, we have the kinetic energy between two moments in time minimized. And if we stick to paths in which energy is conserved, which of course we have to, then between those two moments, between those two events, the system takes the path of least time. For one last note of the chapter, we notice that the kinetic energy can be written as a rank two tensor multiplied by the velocity vector twice. Does this look kind of maybe familiar at all? In special and general relativity, the space-time interval squared is equal to the metric tensor times the position vector twice. So we can define something similar, the phase space interval, which is the mass tensor times the position twice. And by changing variables, we can rewrite the principle of least action in terms of the phase space interval. This is Jacobi's version of the least action principle. And it tells us that like objects in general relativity, systems move on geodesics through phase space. Today, we learned about the Hamiltonian formulation of mechanics. We learned how to construct a Hamiltonian from a Lagrangian and from the total energy of a system if it's applicable. We learned that Hamilton's equations of motion tell us how position and momentum changes with time. We learned about phase space and how we can represent one coordinate and its conjugate momentum on a two-dimensional graph. We looked briefly at how to construct a Hamiltonian in relativistic mechanics, and we took a brief explanation on how to derive Hamilton's equations from a variational principle, namely the principle of least action. Next time, we'll go into chapter nine, 
canonical transformations, which I'm excited for because I have no idea what they are. If you found this video interesting or have any questions, let me know in the comments below and like the video. And if you think this is valuable, you can support me on Patreon like these cool people. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.